Hey y'all, I'm Mickey Gousset. Now that we have learned how to install the GitHub Enterprise Importer, or GEI, it is almost time to start using it. However, before we can start using the tool, we need to make sure we understand how the process should work, as well as what is and isn't migrated. Now for this video, and the next several videos, I'm going to be focused on migrating from GitHub Enterprise Cloud to Enterprise Managed Users. But don't worry, I'm going to cover GitHub Enterprise Server, Azure DevOps, and Bitbucket Server as well before the series is done. Now, let's jump over to some slides where I'm going to talk about how to prepare and plan for migration from GitHub Enterprise Cloud to Enterprise Managed Users, as well as what is and isn't migrated. And I promise this is my last getting ready to migrate video for a while. The next few videos after this will be performing actual migrations. Before running any production migrations, you need to perform several dry runs or trial migrations to help find any problems you might encounter during or after the migrations. You want to identify what repositories and data you're going to migrate. Now this is an important step because you may have repositories that you don't need anymore or repositories where you only need the code, not the metadata. So you could just use git clone mirror push to migrate them. You should also use this step to identify potential problem repositories, such as those containing large files. You need to perform trial or dry run migrations to test the migration process. This includes migrating the repository and also performing post migration steps, such as connecting third party systems to the migrated repo. Dry runs will also give you a time measurement of how long a migration may take so you can plan the appropriate downtime. After each dry run, you should review the migrated code to ensure everything looks okay. You can also review the GEI log files for potential errors. After completing the dry run and validating it, you can and should delete the dry run repo that was migrated. Then you can repeat the dry run again if you desire, or if you're ready, you can perform the production migration. At this point, you're ready to plan your production migration, which includes both the steps to do before the migration, such as restricting access to the migrating repository, as well as steps to handle after the migration, such as implementing security and setting up third-party integrations. I suggest you run the production migration shortly after you finish the dry run, so all the information is fresh in your mind. Now, for this video and the next few videos, I'm focusing on GitHub Enterprise Cloud to Enterprise Managed Users migrations. And for now, we're just going to focus on repository migrations. With GEI, you can also migrate entire organizations, but that comes with different considerations. Now, as far as what is migrated, it's all the stuff in this list. So feel free to pause the video to read the list in detail, or it's also in the documentation. This too. Now, what isn't migrated? That's what I'm about to show you. Again, feel free to pause the video or you can see this list in the documentation. One thing to remember is when you migrate a repository directly, team and team access to the repository is not migrated. So you will need to configure security as a post migration step. So I've given you a list of what does migrate. I've given you a list of what doesn't migrate. Now let's talk about some of the limitations you need to be aware of when performing the migration. First up, these are some github.com enterprise managed user type limitations. You're limited in two gigabytes in size for a single git commit. 
So no single commit in your Git repository can be larger than two gigabytes. If any of your commits are larger than two gigabytes, then you'll have to split them into smaller commits that are two gigabytes or smaller. There's a 255 byte limit for Git references. So no single Git reference, also referred to as a ref, can have a name larger than 255 bytes. Usually, this means that your references cannot be more than 255 characters long. But if you use non-ASCII characters like emojis, that can consume more than one byte. If any of your Git references are too large, then the error message you get back will just be clear. Finally, there's a 100 megabyte file size limit. No single file in your Git repository can be larger than 100 megabytes. So you should consider using Git LFS for storing your larger files. Now, for the scenarios I'm giving you where we're going GitHub Enterprise Cloud to enterprise managed users, these limits probably aren't going to come into play because they would have already been enforced when you were using GitHub Enterprise Cloud. But as you migrate from other systems, there are things you'll need to consider. So now let's talk about some of the GitHub Enterprise Importer limitations you need to be aware of. There's a 10 gigabyte size limit for a Git repository. Now this limit only applies to the source code. And there are some tools out there, such as a tool called Git Sizer, that you can use to check the size of your repository to determine if you're going to go over that limit. There's also a 10 gigabyte limit on metadata. So the importer can't migrate repositories with more than 10 gigabytes of metadata. Metadata is things like issues, pull requests, releases, attachments. In most cases, the largest metadata is caused by binary assets tied to your releases. And you can actually exclude those from the migration if you want to. Git LFS objects are not migrated. Now the importer can migrate repositories that use Git LFS, but the LFS objects themselves are not migrated. They can be pushed to your migration destination as a post-migration task after the migration is complete. Follow-up tasks required. After you, you're done migrating, there are certain things that aren't migrated, like security, and that needs to be reconfigured on the new repository. Delayed code search functionality. So re-indexing the search index can take a couple of hours after the repository is migrated. So code searches may return unexpected results until that re-indexing is complete. So it can take a while. And rule sets configured for your organization can cause migrations to fail. For example, if you've configured a repository rule set that requires email addresses for commit authors to end in, say, at mickeyusay.com, and the repository you're migrating contains commits that don't comply with that rule, the migration will fail. So you might need to disable rule sets while you're doing the migration. Remember, migrations are a project. You need to plan them out appropriately. You need to perform dry runs. You need to make sure developers are enabled and know how to use and access GitHub. You need to make sure you know how to hook up all the integrations to third-party systems after the migration. You'll need to configure security after the migration. The list goes on. Most importantly, you need to communicate with developers to have them validate the dry run migrations and know when the production migrations are scheduled. Okay, I've done all the prep work I wanted to do. Next video, we are gonna jump into the GEI tool and look at how we can migrate a single repo from GitHub Enterprise Cloud to Enterprise Managed Users. Thanks for watching.